Hello, everyone watching, and welcome. Today, I'm going to be talking to the philosopher Julian Bergini, and I hope I've pronounced your surname right because I've heard people That's pronounce okay. it differently. That's okay. <laughs> and we're going to be we're going to be talking about um, this book that you've written, the Godless Gospel, and any other sort of various tangential topics around it as well that we get onto. Um, is there anything you want to say just before we get started? Um, anything that you want to talk about particularly, or you're happy to just focus on? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just book. in your hands. Um, thank okay. you for having me. I'll, I'll follow wherever you lead. No problem. Okay. So um, I suppose at the start, one thing that I wanted um, to talk to you about is you're kind of known as an atheist philosopher, um, but it seems that, you, and you talk about this a little bit in the book, that you had a bit of a relationship with Christianity. You were a Catholic at one point. Could you talk about what your background with Christianity is, um, what that relationship was, and what led to you leaving the faith at some point? Yeah. Um, how long have we got? Now, let me see. So I was, <laughs> I was brought up nominally a Catholic, but it was a bit strange. You know, my mother was just Church of England in that kind of very, very nominal sense. You know, that's what it said in her birth certificate, basically. Yeah. Um, you know, she believed in God, but, you know, that was about it, really. My father um, was Italian, and he really, even by the time I was born, I think, had his own views and wasn't really uh, a Catholic as such. But I think it was quite important for him, for the family, for his, for his mother, that we were brought up Catholic. Right. So, and, you know, if you, if you marry a Catholic, you have to, promised to bring up the children as Catholics. They're, they're very strict like that. So um, I went to a Catholic primary school. And when we did, we had my first communion in Catholicism. So that was like the background in which I sort of grew up until the, about the age of about 11. And what was interesting was that when I went to secondary school, the secondary school wasn't a religious school. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I was suddenly now in a very small minority as a Catholic. Virtually everyone else was Church of England or some other kind of Protestant right. and of course in Britain for anyone listening from outside of Britain what you've got to recognize is that to be a member of the Church of England on paper nine times out of ten at least means virtually nothing so religion suddenly went from being at the heart of school life to being completely unimportant and, and no one around me seemed to take Christianity very seriously at all apart from okay. some strange extremists as they might be seen but you know I kind of thought even at that age you know if, if God exists you know um this is this is important so I kind of continued my own way and for, for a while I kind of you know kept along the path that I knew I did actually get confirmed as a Catholic I have my confirmation certificate I can't even actually remember what my confirmation name was to be honest but you you, you get a and you, you get a name of a saint when you get confirmed um but I kind of didn't really I was having issues with Catholicism, I think. But um, through its youth club, youth clubs are very good or, uh, recruiting tools for churches. I ended up going to a Methodist church, which was, you know, it was a bit more liberal, I think, a bit more modern, a bit more progressive. Um, Methodist churches vary a lot, by the way. So this is just this particular one. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and so for much of my teenage years, I was kind of, you know, seriously pursuing this. But I just had questions and I just kept getting not good enough answers to them and in the end I just kind of there wasn't a epiphany I just sort of drifted away from it really. Do you think during that time you would have said that you had a relationship with Jesus or that you know like you knew God or something like that if you were asked? Yeah I mean that was very interesting because the church itself was I think fairly kind of liberal very moderate very mixed sort of congregation you know, the kind of congregation where you, you wondered whether certain members really believed anything at all, really, <laughs> well, others clearly did. But it's very kind of a Catholic of the small C. Yeah. But the um, Methodist Association of Youth Clubs was a very powerful organisation, and that was pretty evangelical, actually. We used to go to these London weekends they held, which we had, you know, concerts, theatre and stuff, but also a, a, a big collective worship in the Royal Albert Hall, which was a big sort of emotional experience. And, and that was quite evangelical in tone. It was very much talking about your relationship with Jesus. They even did the sort of come on down thing that they do at evangelical rallies, you know, whereas at the end it encouraged people to come down and pledge and all that stuff. So there's quite a lot of talk in the background and visiting Christian drama groups and stuff about, you know, your relationship with Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but no, I, don't, I think I, I didn't, never think I did have that. I think I tried to have one, you know. Right. <laughs> I yeah. prayed and I, but you know, it, it didn't seem to, it just didn't sort of work. And of course, as I got older, it also began to seem just 
yeah, yeah. It's intellectually strange and incoherent that this is this is this is what you would have was there a point where you sort of found yourself where you found it becoming like a live option i mean for a lot of people and this includes myself like around um 18 to 23 sort of as you know you're becoming an adult and um i suppose like life kind of hits you in the face with a few things um that sort of turbulence i found tends to be when the the time period around a lot of people convert back to christianity oh really um, was it yeah i don't know was, was there anything like that for you or was it just no. kind of you know not really once i mean you use this term a live option you know it remained a live option until well, i will tell you a story apologies if anyone's heard this before about i think the moment where it ceased to be a live option for me okay um and after after that point it is interesting it's like a guest out switch you know you go from like a time where god's existence seems evident and obvious and just how could it not be the case to, to, to the opposite, where all of a sudden, you know, well, not all of a sudden, <laughs> uh, there's a period in between where it, it's it's transitioning, but you come out the other end and and, and it just no longer seems, you, you find it hard to, you have to try hard to remember why you believed it in the first place. And you have to try and be right. sympathetic and uh, try to imagine why some people still do and not just think that they're deluded fools. Yeah. But the kind of, the, 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 the moment which sort of cemented it for me was, uh, again, one of these London weekends and, you know, my, my faith had been wavering, you know, and I've been praying and all that kind of stuff. And I kind of almost thought this would be the last shot because the thing about this this weekend was you, you can imagine, you know, it's a, thousands of young people together. It's, it's quite galvanizing emotionally. And I think that a lot of people get their sort of peak religious experiences often in that kind of group yeah. setting. And I thought, well, let's give it one more go. Let's see if this gives us the spiritual shot in the arm that we need <laughs> after this i thought if god exists god doesn't want me to believe in him because what happened was on the coach up i started to feel really sick and by the time i got there i was just vomiting and i was really unwell and so for the first 24 hours i was feeling pretty dreadful and it was basically just i didn't do anything on the sunday i did go to the i was feeling a bit better but still feeling rough i went to the uh, Apple hall but I, I I I didn't go in with everyone else. There was like a sick bay area kind of thing, St. John's Ambulance area, which the Royal Albert Hall, people who don't know, is this very huge circular arena. And it's very steeply tiered. And at the very top in the gods is this very high gallery. And that's where I was with the St. John's Ambulance about the volunteers, not feeling a bit quite queasy, not being really in the group, but looking at it. And it is it, a very memorable experience for me because I was like seeing it for the first time as an outsider and as an outsider to me it seemed very evident that what was going on right. was not the holy spirit moving it was not a cynical mass hysteria and mass hysteria is perhaps a, a loaded term but it was the generation of an emotional mood through through music through emotion through man manipulation again i think people were sincere i'm not saying they're fraudsters they thought they were creating the yeah. conditions for the holy spirit to do its work but from the outside this just seemed obviously just a and, and it didn't affect me because I was feeling a bit queasy and I was separated and yeah. you know really by the end of that I thought no I just don't believe this and and from that point onwards I think you know I, I've never been tempted to go back I've never lost my interest in religion but I've I've never been tempted by anything like uh, let's what should we call it traditional belief yeah. in a god and in Jesus as savior in particular so I guess that moves on to the next question, which is um, specifically about the book and what prompted you to write it. So I suppose, you know, as an atheist um, author, I was kind of expecting it to be a polemic against Christianity and the Christian moral system. But it seems more like an attempt to figure out, you know, what were the ethical teachings of Jesus um, and more the historical Jesus and the theological Jesus, I suppose. Well, um, I would yeah. say not the historical Jesus. I mean, okay. so quite a, quite a lot to unpack from your question there. I mean, first yeah. of all, um, yeah, I, I've never had much time for these highly polemical attacks on on religion. I think that there are forms of religion which are harmful, which are idiotic, which are foolish. But to dismiss all of religion like that, I think, is is just patently unfair. I mean, you know, I know Christians. I know people of other faiths, too. Uh, a lot of them are very intelligent, smart people. You know, whatever's going on, it's not pure idiocy for sure. And I think that, you know, it seems to me that within religious forms of life, 
to use that somewhat perhaps fashionable phrase, there are things of value there and, pe and people are grappling with important things. They're trying to mm -hmm. find a way of orienting themselves to the world, which I don't know, has a sense of purpose and meaning and value. And of course, I believe you can do that as an atheist. Of course I do. But I think that it, I'm interested in how it works from a religious point of view and whether there's anything that we can learn from it if you're not religious yourself. So I was never going to do it just like a hatchet job. But the interest in this particular book was simply, in, in a way, it, it might sound silly, it's like, like a bit of a frustration really, because I just got sick of hearing people say that they didn't believe Jesus was the son of God, but they believed he was a great moral teacher. Okay. And I kind of thought that was just too easy. I mean, people just repeat that. And then you say, well, okay, so tell me, what is it about his moral teachings which is so great then? Uh, yeah, and people would say things like, you know, well, I love thy neighbour and, uh, you know, right. do unto others. And you go, well, that's, that's nothing. It's not very original, frankly. You know, he wasn't the first person to say those things. Other people said them in ways which perhaps even were more fully articulated and a bit more rigorous, perhaps, you know. So so, so why do you think this? So I kind of like thought, well, look, let's, let's sort this out once and for all. If we're going to say he's a great moral teacher and you don't believe in God, and he was a son of God, d does that stack up? Um, and the reason I say it's not a search for historical Jesus is that I think that, f first of all, I, I think whether you're religious or not, um, the historical Jesus is something of a mystery. Um, you know, to believe that the Gospels give an accurate account of the historical Jesus, I think is extremely naive. And most intellectual Christians don't believe that. I mean, they can see that Jesus has a different kind of personality in the different Gospels. He's not the same character. Um, you know, that's not to say that none of these things correspond to the way Jesus was. The most optimistic view is that all of these authors have in different ways captured accurately certain facets of the historical Jesus. That's optimistic, right. given that the Gospels are written many, many years later. Um, but, you know, e even that, we don't have the historical Jesus. If you don't believe Jesus was the son of God, then I'm just thinking, well, what could that mean? Because obviously you don't mean that you know what the historical Jesus thought. All it can mean is that you think what the records we have of Jesus, if you take away all the divine stuff, all the miracles, what you're left with is valuable right. moral teaching. So it's simply that. It's a kind of a thought experiment in a way. Whether or not um, the, the Jesus of the Gospels is a historical Jesus or not. If you believe in, the, in Jesus as a great moral teacher, the only thing you have to refer to are his teachings. And if you don't believe he's a son of God, you've got to put a red line through all the passages in which he says he's a son of God, performs miracles, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I did. I put a red line through it. Um, I got what was left. I rearranged it because, of course, a lot of the stories are repeated in the different Gospels and created a single hybrid gospel and that's actually just a very very fascinating exercise so i do say to people if you're not interested in what i have to say which is very understandable i don't blame you um it's worth getting the book in a way just so to have a look at that to have a look at what's left of the gospels if you take out all the supernatural mm -hmm. religious it's quite a lot but it does it does make it a very very different kind of book and yeah. also you know has a much more dramatic finale i think yeah that's that is interesting i wonder um wait how much of um like Christians who tried to do, I mean, a similar kind of thing um to this sort of influenced your thought? Because I, I know you talked to um Keith Ward a little bit, mm. but there's also a guy called Don Cupid, who I think mm. he he will, was an Anglican minister, but mm. did something I think very similar, but with his whole theology where he was like, you know, there's no God in involved at all. Who who were the main kind of influences from yeah. a Christian? Oh, Cupid Cup Cup is 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 a fascinating uh, guy, I got to interview him actually many many years ago, um, and he was a very very interesting person to talk to. So uh, it's non-realist theology they kind of call it. So this these are attempts to kind of make sense of of Christianity uh, while not um, believing in anything supernatural, I guess. So there's a lot of overlap there. Now I think the point is I think that a lot of people who do that from within the Christian tradition. What they're really trying to do is they're trying to save as much of the whole edifice as possible, if you like. And so for them, the stories of the healings and the miracles and all these kind of things still have a, a value, but they have a value as kind of allegory, as metaphor, as more poetic stories, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there are lots of people doing that. So in a way, I think plenty of people have done that. It is very interesting. 
I think you can go a long way with it. Although I do think it's interesting that um, it's it doesn't seem to have the legs. It always ends up being a minority pursuit. So, for example, the right. Sea of Faith Network. Hello, anyone from the Sea of Faith Network here. I've spoken at one of your conferences before. Um, this was you know established by Don Cupier, and it's still going. You know, it is still going. It's vibrant in its own way. But, you know, in terms of numbers, I uh, don't think I'm offending anyone by saying that, you know, the numbers are, are very, very small. Um, it takes a very particular kind of person to kind of want to stick with uh, Christianity, having sort of rejected so much of yeah. those traditional beliefs. I think within the mainstream church, perhaps there are even more people, actually. In other words, they don't they don't bother to leave to form a separate movement. They just sort of have their doubts, have their worries, and get on with it. I think there's quite a lot of clergy like that, to be quite honest. Yeah. I've, I've spoken to some of them. Um, so so, so th there's a lot on that. A lot of people have written about that. There's a lot about understanding uh, the Gospels as, as mythos rather than logos, you know, so um, not myth in a derogatory sense of made-up stories, but as kind of poetic truth rather than literal truth. Um, but I think I just wanted to sort of, uh, it's a different exercise. It's a kind of a thought experiment. It's you know, let's just say we, we simply say there's nothing to these stories uh, that they're made up. And, yeah. you know, and in, in a sense that it, it, I suppose one one reason for doing it is I'm, I'm not convinced we're getting to the authentic Christianity if we have that kind of reading. I think it seems quite obvious that the people who wrote those first Gospels and everything did not realize. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, 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 I mean, to be honest, most people seem to believe quite clearly that they, they believe the end times were coming, you know. I mean, there's yeah. quite a lot of that in the epistles. There's stuff of it in the Gospels. They literally thought the end times were coming, you know. So so I think to read it backwards from now and to say, oh, no, and it was all, it was all just mythos. It, wasn't, it was never meant to be literally true. I think that's yeah. kind of reassuring, but I don't think that really works, <laughs> yeah. ultimately. So let's try something else. Is there anything – you've just completely rejected it as a religion. You completely rejected it, but is there anything worth saving in the teachings? Decent question, I think. So um, in terms of those teachings then, one of the first things that you go going to talk about is Jesus' teaching of metanoia, um, which you sort of articulate as like a, a change of the heart. Um, now, can you can you talk about what this is? You know, what, what's Jesus trying to um, convince us of in terms of how we how we should act as people in, in these stories and things about metanoia, about change? Yeah. Heart? I mean, obviously, it's not my term. It's one used a lot in Christian theology. So metanoia, change of heart and mind is, is the way it's usually kind of um, presented. And I mean, the, the reason I start with that and think that's the heart of it is that actually that does seem to be the thing that things come back to again and again and again so i mean you know in discussing the book and having comments from people you know some people have suggested that other things are perhaps primary so for example you know love it's been suggested to me that isn't the core right. message of jesus love love thy neighbor uh love you know love for god in the metaphorical sense uh love for the poor well, you know, there's quite a lot of that in the gospel, but I just think that overwhelmingly the theme that goes back to again and again and again is about the transformation of your, yourself, your soul. So even those things about the poor and the, and the weak and, and the sick, it's, it, it's really, I mean, in a sense, this is disappointing for me. I'd rather have kind of liked it if Jesus were a kind of, you know, kind of proto-socialist, if you like. I'm, I'm not a socialist myself, but, you know, a kind of proto-social democrat, you know, a crusader for social justice, a friend of the poor in the sense that he wants the poor to, you know, have what the rich have. But I think it's quite clear he doesn't want the poor to have what the rich have. <laughs> the rich are burdened by their wealth. It does them no good to have all this money. It's actually bad for them. Why? Because it, it takes your attention away from what really matters, your own soul, your own heart. So a lot of the teachings about the poor, for example, are as it seems to be more about why it's important for you to get rid of your wealth than it is why it's important for the poor to have it, if you like. There's this very interesting parable of, of a feast in which a king invites people to the feast and everyone turns him away. And he sends people out to round up the poor and the sick to come to the feast, right? right. And it's, it's not, they're not um, 
there voluntarily <laughs> at all. Yeah. They had to be kind of uh, uh, th- th- rounded up. And, and part of the reason is to kind of get back at the people who, who rejected him. And in fact, one of the people, right. who, bizarre, bizarre twist in the story, is punished for wearing the wrong clothes, which I think is is a, a, one of those more mysterious things in the gospel. There are various yeah. little things like that where you think, what what, what is going on? And, you know, the, ri- the rich man who is told to, give away his his all everything he has to follow him you know who doesn't do it it's bad it's bad for him mm-hmm. and there is this famous line which everyone knows which is it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven and a very strange metaphor but not so strange when you realize the eye of the needle was a gate in jerusalem i i know these things are still contested so none of these interpretations are entirely true yeah. But if, if uh, entirely, sorry, 100% yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. But uh, this one makes sense. If this were the right one, it would make sense because it, there is a gate, but it's a very narrow gate. So can a camel pass through it? Yes. Can a camel pass through it if it's got stuff on its back and its side? No, it can't. It has to be unburdened to go through. And that seems to fit the message so many times. So so again and again, that's what it seems to come back to. is It's, 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 it's purity of heart, purity of soul. Interestingly, again, you see, this makes it not so different from a lot of other ideas that were sort of knocking around in the Greco-Roman world at the time. Um, A lot of people have uh, pointed out similarities between Christianity and Stoicism, for example. The Stoics basically had the view that the only thing that really mattered was your own virtue, your own goodness, and that everything else was basically had, had no importance at all. Um, you know, nice though it might be to have a, a cup of tea, it doesn't matter if you don't, and you know you certainly shouldn't make the pursuit of a nice cup of tea your main focus uh, during the day. Uh, and, and that's a very very similar idea. So, mm. you know, it, so first of all, it's an idea which does seem to be the most coherent interpretation of what he says, and secondly, it, it makes sense as an idea that has resonance with other ideas that were, were going around at the time. Mm. I wonder. Um, so that there's a. A few people, um, when I talk to Christian apologists, there's a few sort of people who are throwing around some of these ideas, but saying this, the idea of kind of individualism, individual um, self-worth, individual change and stuff comes from Christianity in this way. And, but, but it's because of a Christian heritage. And I don't know if you're familiar with, um, like Tom Holland's, uh, book Dominion, where, which he's written and a lot of apologists are really quite, um, I, yeah. I don't know, quite reliant on, on his work to say, you know, when atheists are saying this value is good, um, it really originates in Christianity and Jesus teaching. We would all, um, I think moral capital is another book, which takes a similar, yeah. you know, like the idea. Um, do, do you have any thoughts around, like, yeah. do, do you think we we really do kind of owe a debt to Christianity for some of these modern values that we have? Um, or would you say they're sort of floating around in that kind of, um, Greco, I can't, I can't think of the right word, you know, the, the, the kind yeah, of yeah. Greco-Roman sort of milieu. Well, uh, to be honest, I mean, I, I don't have a lot of time for those arguments because it seems to me, what, what could it what could it mean? Um, I mean, first of all, it could be historically true that, I mean, obviously we're in a, 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 a society which has been Christian for a couple of millennia, right? So obviously that shaped us. I mean, that just seems to be obviously true. But um, does that mean that we can no longer be anything else? Or if we decide to change to be something else, then we're going to be reminded that, oh, you wouldn't have got here if it weren't for us. I mean, that's just kind of, I think it's almost like trivially true that we've been fashioned by millennia of Christian thought. So, so first of all, that's not the key question. The question is, can these values stand on their own two feet or not, which is a separate right. question. Now, some people say they can't. So someone like Nick Spencer, for example, is, has a similar version of this. He would say that it's not only that history is responsible for giving us these values, it's that we take away the Christian foundations, they can't stand. I don't think that's true either. And I think the reason it's not true is partly a reason why the historical story is too simplistic anyway, because, you know, we have many uh, influences on our culture. And in addition to the Christian, there is also that that whole particularly classical greek one and in fact you can't even properly separate them uh the christianity was very much shaped by platonic thought uh, and greek thought particularly see it particularly in john's gospel 
But as things developed, if you, if you read the the synoptic gospels there, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, for example, in particular, there's there's nothing in there which suggests uh, belief in immaterial souls as separate from the body. And a lot mm. of the early Christ Christians, again, this is pretty uncontroversial. A lot of the early Christians absolutely didn't have any belief in in a separate soul. Uh, for, for actually for millennia, it was very important that the body was buried so that it would be uh, there for the resurrection. And graves would actually be turned towards the, the east so that they would be able to rise to face the sun on, on the last day. So over the years, the, the idea which became popular in, in lots of corners of Christianity, that we had immaterial souls and we had this sort of dualistic picture, that comes from Plato, it doesn't come from the Gospels, it doesn't come from early Christianity. And of course, again, a lot of the medieval theologians were basically uh, Aristotelians who were sort of bringing together Christianity and Aristotle. So, uh, you know, I, even even the story of the Christian origins is one which brings in a lot from ancient Greece too. And just particularly over recent centuries, I just think we've, we've, we've come a long way from that. So I, I kind of, I, I do hear this argument a lot and I, I, I must admit it seems... I don't think it sticks. What seems to make it persuasive is, well, what might make it seem persuasive is if you believe that in order to have a moral system, you need some kind of transcendental foundation, right? So if you kind of start with that premise, you can't possibly, you know, good and bad, right and wrong are meaningless unless they have some eternal transcendental underpinning, then you, of course you're going to reach the conclusion that secular ethics isn't enough. The question is, why would you believe that? And I don't, you know, I don't think there's any reason to believe it, frankly. I mean, uh, in, in classical Chinese thought, has done very well for a couple of thousand years without having sort of basic, other than they have this loose notion of the way of heaven, but the way of heaven really means the way of nature, right? as simple as that. It's not, it's not about a divine fiat or anything. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I struggle with that one. So, um, Moving on then one to one part um, in the chapter, Making Yourself Humble, um, where you paint Jesus as sort of being opposed to, um, what's the right way of putting it? Like, so almost like ecclesial authority, like, um, mm. and, and I suppose people um, who might want to get involved in these sorts of theological debates, you know, like the Pharisees. So to, to quote on page 99, you say, one of the most striking anti-hierarchical passages comes when he says, but be not ye called rabbi, and all ye are brethren, neither be ye called masters, but he, he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. There should be no ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical hierarchies, no priests, only brethren. It seems extraordinary how flagrantly almost all Christian churches have ignored this clear instruction and have created arcane layers of clerics. Mm. Um, I thought that was really interesting. But um, in speaking to some of the Christians who are in my kind of circles, they were like, well, that can't be, you know, what Jesus is saying. You know, uh, um, you are Peter, you know, on this rock, I build my church. What's the church in that case? You know, Jesus is clearly in favor of, uh, you know, authority. So what, what do you say to um, um, that sort of response? <laughs> the, the, the thing is that the, I didn't want to play this game of inconsistencies. The, the point is, right. There are inconsistencies in, in what Jesus said. The right. only way to make sense of it is not to go looking for, to cherry pick the passages which fit what you would like to be the case. You have to look about where the general thrust is pointing, where most things are pointing. And they'll say, yes, so you are Peter, upon, upon you I, I build my church. Well, actually, I believe, now I've got to be very careful here, but as um, the term church there, uh, it's a bit misleading anyway, actually. I think the word that was used, and I can't remember what it was, uh, it was be much more, a much more natural kind of translation would be something like community or something. Okay. And the, the, early, the early Christians, that's what they formed. They had these kind of uh, communities. And uh, the early Christians didn't, didn't have that kind of church structure at all. So I think that that is a case of where people point to that passage as being definitive. First of all, they're worrying basically on a fairly dodgy translation, a mis an anachronistic translation, actually. Uh, but secondly, you know, even if that's what he said there, you have to balance that against all the other times where he said things like what I was, the passage you read out is the most explicit one. 
but it doesn't occur in isolation. It's not like for the rest of the Gospels, he's going around um, praising institutions and talking about the Nisa. He does nothing but attack the, st the strictures, the hierarchies, and all these kind of things. So it just seems, it, it, and that just seems obvious. And again, I have to say, it's interesting that Christian Jews spoke, say, well, that can't be right. Surely, surely, surely. Um, most of the people I spoke to, uh, you know, kind of say, well, yeah, you know, but the but they would say is the point is that Jesus never really laid down a template for the next 2000 years. He was speaking to his time and for what was necessary at that time. And actually, you, know, you probably expected the end of the world to come soon anyway, right? right. So, so the, the, the answer isn't the, no, no, Jesus didn't say that. If you want to justify church, you have to say, well, you know, he, he, he left it open what should happen hundreds of years later. And, you know, uh, this, it's very difficult to maintain this tradition over time without some kind of institutional strictures. But I, but I actually think even that is not quite good enough in the sense that I still think that most Christians should be a bit embarrassed about how, well, depending on the denomination, but in a lot of times, just how much um, hierarchy, you know, rabbinical power, in, it's not rabbis anymore, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, does, it just seems so obviously to go against the spirit of what Jesus was saying that I think Christians should be honest and say, I, you know, in this respect, the Christian church over history has failed to live up to the teachings of its uh, founder, which it seems to be a perfectly reasonable thing to say. In fact, it'd be the only thing to say. Um, given that Christian uh, Jesus says, be thee perfect, uh, when he also says that no one is perfect, not even himself. Um, yeah, and, and he talks about how we always fall short, how we're always imperfect. Uh, the Christian church shouldn't have any trouble in acknowledging its own imperfections and how it's fallen short what it should do mm. it'd be it'd be actually extraordinary for any christian church to turn around and say we we've you know we've done exactly what jesus wanted of us <laughs> that's 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 not that's not humble for a start that's not accepting our imperfection and and for people who are non-theists reading those sorts of teachings of jesus is there any kind of value in those sort of um anti-institutional anti-kind of pharisaical uh, those criticisms of the pharisees that jesus has that you think um you know the non-theist can kind of take from it because maybe there's no direct kind of church in my life that mm. i can point to though even even as a non-theist i do actually go to justin Brealey's zoom meetings on a sunday and uh, yeah 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 <laughs> well i mean I, I think you know certain of his teachings have more resonance for certain people than others but I think, you know, they, they do kind of form a, a coherent whole in a way. And I think that one of the things that it connects to is that idea of, you know, non-judgment, if you like, that, you know, we should, it's not that we should just say anything goes, who am I to say what's right or wrong, etc. I mean, Jesus doesn't do that. He's, he's teaching about what's right and wrong all the time. But he's very, very reluctant to actually point the finger at an individual and say, you, wicked, wrong, you know. And, and why? Because, well, for a start, who has the authority to do that? So the story of the woman taken in adultery is, I think, the clearest example of this. Um, she's brought to him and they say to him, you know, should she be stoned to death as is the law of Moses? And this, this is a trap, basically. Because they know that Jesus isn't in favour of stoning anyone to death. Uh, but they also know he's very good at sort of like saying that he's upholding the law, not going against it. So what does he do? He just says, he who is without sin, cast the first stone. And everyone, one by one, walks away. And then he goes to the woman and he says, you know, who, who, have, who hath condemned thee? And she said, no one, Lord, she says, neither do I go and sin no more. Now, this is very interesting because um, he says, who has condemned thee? And she says, no one. Well, you know, so condemned here doesn't mean accused of doing wrong. Right. And he also says, go and sin no more, assuming that she has sinned in what she's done. And he actually has said elsewhere that adultery is a sin. So it's, it's very interesting. It's that recognition that, you know, you don't hide from saying what's right and what's wrong. But you almost all you, you do not put yourself in a position of authority over another individual to judge them, you know, uh, because you don't have that authority yourself. So I think the anti-hierarchical, anti-clerical thing uh, resonates with that. 
And I think, you know, I think that does um, have a resonance, actually. Uh, as someone who doesn't believe in God, you know, I think that challenge, who, who are you to judge, is, is a powerful one, I think, you know. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that anything goes. It doesn't mean you let everything pass. But it does mean you're always very, very careful. And uh, even when you do have to, for certain reasons, make a judgment and sort of legislate about something, is to refrain from ca condemning the, the, the person, if you like, you know. Um, so there's this, this phrase which is sometimes a bit dangerous. It can be misused, you know, uh, hate this, love the sinner, hate the sin. You know, that, that seems to be a fairly good distillation. Yeah. I often hear that one actually just used as like a mask for homophobia, basically. <laughs> Stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. But, I, yeah. I, like I said, I mean, it is, can be misused. I think that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're, you're right. Um, but it needn't be, you know. And yeah. the thing is, is it, why is it used in that context, right? I mean, that, they're using that in context as, I mean, look, you know, most people would say homosexuality isn't a sin. So that's a very, very bad <laughs> uh, use of the, ex yeah. of the example. But, you know, in everyday life, there are things we would say. I mean, sin is an interesting category. I, mean, I don't believe in sin, so we'd have to sort of secularise it in some way. But, you know, I mean, people are pretty rubbish, I think. I'm a bit of a mis misanthrope in a way, you know. And I'm a person myself, so I guess that means I'm a bit rubbish too. And, you know, but most people don't, do, don't behave poorly or badly out of real malicious intent. It's usually thoughtlessness, willful blindness unwillful blindness, weakness, and we're kind of all like this. And, you know, I think that being aware of that kind of fallen state of everyone means that, yeah, you know, someone can do something wrong, do the wrong thing, and you can very be very unhappy with it, hate the sin, as it were, but, you know, hate the sinner. I, I, my father, I always used to say, <laughs> um, it, we, particularly I think some of our, his, his children would say, oh, I hate blah, blah, blah. And he'd say, don't hate anybody kind of thing. And I, I still find myself saying that in a kind of a, almost kind of a parodic way. But I, I kind of, that's one of the things he said, which I, I kind of do try to to live by. You know, it's hard sometimes, uh, but don't don't hate anybody unless you really have to, let's put it that way. I think it's a pretty good rule to live by. It, it's interesting um, from a secular perspective, I suppose, this use of the word sin as, as opposed to, I suppose, like moral error or something like mm. that. Um, an another quote from the book on page 112. Um, I was just saying the page numbers in case of it, if anyone's either gets the book or, or has it, you know, and they want mm. to listen to this and check it out, they can. Um, and you say, uh, it's, it's about Judas, Judas Iscariot who, who betrays Jesus. And you say, um, the mechanism for, for his action here is, is his con conscience, uh, dramatized in the gospel by the story of Judas, Judas Iscariot. Judas betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, no one in the gospels ever judges or punishes him for this. Even Jesus, who is shown to know Judas will betray him, simply tells him, uh, what you do, do quickly. Um, the price of sin is not that you will be sent to hell by a divine judge or that karmic forces will ensure you're paid back. Uh, the price of being bad is that you have to live with being the person who did wrong. Um, and I, I thought this was particularly interesting. You know, as, as I was reading this, it certainly sort of um, rang true for me. But I, I wonder as well about the language of sin. Do you think that um, atheists should keep that language around to talk about moral error? Do you think they should adopt adopt something else? Um, and how how should sin be used in a secular sense? I suppose if it, if it's being kept. Yeah, no, it's a good question. I, I, don't, I didn't really, as I was writing the book, that's not something I, I thought um, deeply about. I was kind of taking it on its on its own terms. Mm. I, I guess I'm, I'm not I'm not very keen on the idea of sin. I think it has too many wrong connotations, which I think uh, it'd be very hard to shake off. You know, when you when you when you use a certain vocabulary. A vocabulary comes with a certain baggage. And I think part of the problem with sin is, and maybe this has nothing to do with its original usage in the Gospels, but okay. the problem with sin is that, um, you know, it's like <laughs> that song, It's a Sin, which is now the TV series, you know, it gets associated with sort of certain actions, you know. So certain particular right. actions and things become sinful. And it's sort of a way of like, it's a bit, it becomes a bit Manichaean, really. This is bad. Whereas actually, I do think that, you know, it, I don't think morality and ethics is really like that. I think it's about the manner in which you conduct yourself. And it's very difficult to 
there are very few acts which are in and of themselves always wrong. I mean, killing is the obvious example. Um, very few people would say that killing is always wrong. It depends on how you do it. Lying as well. And, you know, I think, and, the, and I also think sin has become so associated in particular with sexual sin. You know, if you just talk about sin today, I mean, the, the reason the song is it's a sin is because, you know, it, it's, it's very much about, I think, homosexuality in particular. And, you know, the idea of, you know, oh, this is a wicked thing I'm doing with, with, with my with my body. And with, with you know, the sexual acts, again, I mean, it's not, you know, paedophilia, absolutely wrong in every single circumstance. Uh, rape, absolutely. But, you know, what exactly is being done <laughs> other than that? It's, it's the context and the manner and where there's consent. These are the key factors. It's, it's not about what exactly is happening with which um, organ or genital and, and whatever else it might be. So I just think it's very difficult to hold on to the, to the language of sin without it being unhelpful. On the other hand, I think that there's something interesting and useful about it in that I think that if you go to the kind of archetypal kind of secular view of ethics, which is about consequences, the sort of utilitarian thing, it becomes mm -hmm. all about the consequences of your actions. And I think that it goes back to this thing about metanoia and change of heart and soul and everything. I think that in our culture today, we perhaps do miss the importance of thinking about the effects actions have on our, whatever you want to call it, I wouldn't call it soul, but let's mm, use soul yeah. metaphorically on our psyche, on ourselves. Um, when we behave in certain ways, it kind of, everything we do forms who we are and has an effect on who we are. Um, this is something, and again, there's a sim certain similarity here, I think, between what Jesus said and the virtue ethics tradition in of Aristotle, but also like Confucius. So, you know, what we do shapes the self. You fashion the self by what we do. And so the, the idea of sin, I think, captures that in a way, because it's saying that there's a kind of an inner, inner effect. There's a bad inner tainting that happens when you do the wrong thing. Uh, and I think perhaps we we could do to think about that um, and uh, not just think about right or wrong purely in terms of consequences. Yeah, I, I can't remember if this was in um, your book or somewhere else where I read it. Um, something about um, but Aristotelian virtue ethics being more along the lines of or, or perhaps more catering for sort of um, the Athenian middle classes, mm. whereas um, this kind of virtue ethics that Jesus is teaching, mm. maybe, maybe it was a sermon or something I heard it in, I don't know, <laughs> being more, um, you know, like for, for this accessible for the slave who didn't have access to material wealth, but they could still change their heart or something. And yeah, it, what do we take from that, though, without without it being, you know, because we're all justified before God in his eyes in the same way? What do we take from that as secular people that um, is valuable? Yeah, right. Well, I, mean, I did talk about that bit in the book, so maybe you heard it from both sources. I mean, you know, I don't have a monopoly on this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, most most of what I do is is the bringing together of ideas rather than the hatching of brilliant ones, I'm afraid to say. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I, 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 if you ask me, you know, what's the heart or the, the basis of my kind of moral worldview, it would be Aristotle, it would be be Hume. It's the idea of a, a flourishing life. It's not based on anything transcendental. And I, I still think that's right. But I do think there's a kind of a, a problem there, which is that the flourishing life is simply not accessible to everybody. It just, you know, it just it has historically, it's been a minority. So in Aristotle's time, yeah, you're right. You know, it's all very well for the free person of Athens, but, you know, for every one of them, I think there were three slaves. So, you know, um, that's not a very good ratio of flourishing um for hume as well you know i mean hume was a middle class scot at the time and most people were still struggling to, to survive and i think that you know what the kind of vision of the flourishing life they they present to us is, is an ideal to strive towards it's something we would want for everyone but all the time there is great poverty and suffering in the world we we need to kind of not lose sight of that and not um, you know, just go about the pursuit of our own flourishing with indifference. And I think that that's why I think Jesus remains a useful kind of challenge. So, you know, it's, it's that recognition that there, there is something, yeah, kind of almost repugnant in pursuing your own flourishing 
when at the expense of others i think although having said that as i said the point is that at the end of the day i think jesus does think and this is why i just can't agree with him i think he thinks that it's actually good to be poor you know not not so desperate that you're in pain and agony. i don't say glorify suffering and pain but it's actually good to have you know j- just enough to eat just enough clothes to wear and 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 that's it because then you can focus on your heart and your soul and that's what re- really matters in life right. uh, i don't go the whole way with that because i think you know this is where i am more uh, humanistic i i believe this is a, a wonderful world which has great opportunities um to enjoy it and everything and i i i i <laughs> yeah I, I i i don't think we should be apologetic at all about wanting uh, to to really savor it and the point for me of helping the poor if there is a point in helping the poor is so that they can have more of that themselves too you know mm. yeah i i wonder um and I, I think maybe after this question i talk a bit more about um the the meta ethics um of like a secular worldview because there, there was an interesting bit on that at the end um good without god but um i wonder as well how you would respond to um a lot of christians like c.s lewis's famous kind of trilemma argument would want to say that you can't sort of have jesus as this good moral teacher uh you know i either he's um lord or a lot i can't remember it's or he's like a demon out of the gates of hell or something i can't remember exactly how it's phrased but how how would you respond to the idea that you you sort of can't segregate out um some of these teachings and say, yeah. you know, well, this is a good thing. You've either got to say, no, he's crazy advising you to, you know, live like this or do this. It only, it only works if there's, you know, the, the first shall be last. You need, you need heaven in place at the end to um, take this course of action. Or... Uh, I think, I think, I think, look, that, that argument works only if you think that your only choice is to take the Jesus of the gospels or not lock, stock and barrel or not. The Jesus of the Gospels in his full incarnation claims to be the son of God, um, claims to be the son of man more often, actually. Um, it may not be entirely clear what that means, uh, but you can only fudge it so much. You know, I think it's very clear that the, the Jesus of the Gospels has some sort of claim to divinity, he certainly believes in the divine um, and so forth. So if, if, if that's the only choice you've got, the trilemma kind of holds. But... Obviously, that's not the only choice you've got. Funnily enough, I first came across this many, many years ago, watching some documentary about the um, Jesus Army, which is an <laughs> evangelical evangelical British group. And they were talking about they're having this kind of training session for you know how they responded to people, uh, you know, who, who were skeptical on the streets. And I think yeah. they were talking about the person who says, yeah, you know, I believe in God. I mean, I, Jesus is a good guy, but I don't think he's a savior. So you turn around and say to them, look, either you're saying he was a liar <laughs> or or you know yeah. or you're wrong or something like that you know and i thought well, that's ridiculous because obviously the person who says they believe that jesus wasn't the son of god doesn't believe that the gospels are reliable right i mean it's as right. simple as that so the the the, the choice lewis c.s lewis doesn't give us the rather obvious choice which is to conclude well, well, actually, it's actually suspend judgment. Who knows what the historical Jesus said? But, you know, um, we've got these teachings here. And uh, it's very possible someone could offer these, first offer these teachings. You know, maybe this Messiah stuff was added later. You know, the other authors made that up. They attributed him the miracles. They did this kind of thing, you know. And there's some reason to think there's, there's some truth to that. I mean, certainly it seems like the resurrection story seems to get more and more embellished as time goes on. And it's it's actually... It's only alluded to in Mark. It's not even there. You know, it, 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 they do say Jesus has come back to life, but that's all they say. There's no spotting or anything. Mm. So you, you evade the trilemma like that. It, it, if if Jesus existed, it has a historical character. He wasn't the son of God, and um, the other stuff was made up. Or, but there's there's even a fourth option, to be honest, which is that you know he might have been some kind of crazy sort of genius you know i mean <laughs> he may have thought himself to be the son of god he may have genuinely thought that but at the same time you know he unlike a lot of other people who who think they're divine or think they have some kind of divine mission he actually said stuff which people held on to and was interesting had a power to them so he's kind of a mad genius so yeah maybe he was mad but that doesn't mean that his that doesn't mean his teachings aren't worth 
listening to mm. either. In fact, quite a lot of philosophers were a bit bonkers, really, weren't they? I mean, you know, I mean, uh, I don't think if you're going to write a, di- a book on the model of psychological good health, you would sort of pick people like uh, Wittgenstein, for example, or even yeah. Schopenhauer, for that matter. So, yeah, I-, I find that such a lame argument, I'm afraid. So um, one um, argument that's been really popular with apologists is will it, the way William Lane Craig puts his uh, moral argument, you know, if, uh, if God does not exist, then there can't be any objective uh, moral facts or values, but there are objective moral facts and values, um, therefore God does exist. Now, um, mm, yeah, sorry, I shouldn't... Um, yeah. <laughs> But but I, but in 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 your book you sort of paint this so so I suppose for for a lot of Christians the idea that moral facts and values are the, this transcendent you know non natural mm. good that somehow has something to do with God's nature is um, a really important piece of theology and and you sort of discuss in the book about whether we can be good um, without that do, you know do, or, or is that is it available should should the atheist think that there is this non natural you know irreducible good thing or um, you know, need we even think that in order to be able to be good and to say, you know, this is good advice from Jesus in certain places that we can incorporate into our lives. I, I, um, I think when Christians offer that argument, they're, they're, they're really underestimating themselves. I, I hope they're underestimating themselves. I mean, what I'd say to them is, are you telling me that the reason why you uh, give money to the poor, the reason you don't murder people, the reason you don't like such is is because you have a belief that there is some that these there are rules against doing this which exist in some transcendental realm and they are enforced by a a good God. Is that why you do it? Really? Really? Because I don't think so. I think you do these things because you're a decent human being. And this is why, you know, so the, so the alternative view, which comes from, yeah, there comes in, there's a sort of cynical and less cynical version. The cynical version, and it's not even that cynical, is simply that these are rules for social interaction, right? So the reason we have morality is that we need to get on. And the way to get on is to treat each other with respect, not to kill, all these things. And it's all our interests kind of do that. It's a simple quid pro quo. I mean, that's kind of, that may be good enough, actually. That wouldn't be awful. But, um, People like Hume and Adam Smith went a bit further and said, no, it's not just that we kind of decide to do this because it's practical. Actually, we have a, a, a fundamental kind of instinct. We have moral sympathy, as they called it. You know, um, When you see someone in pain, it, partly you know what pain is. You recognise it is bad, not because it is bad in some transcendental sense. You don't need to sort of like, if you see someone riding around in pain, you think, hmm, is that good or bad? I wonder, you know, what does the rule book say? You know, you know it's bad, and you know that by a kind of sympathy, kind of mirroring, you know, um, and then you're moved to do something about that. Okay, so at the root of ethics is that fundamental compassion we have for each other and understanding we have for each other. And then the intellectual aspect of that, you know, builds on that. It sort of like makes sure we don't just sort of simply follow our instincts, even when it's counterproductive. And you, you get morality that way. Now, the thing is this, I, I, if someone's going to tell me that as a Christian, you know, they, they, they require this. I like to say, you know, do you genuinely believe then that if you lost your faith tomorrow, you'd turn into an immoral, rampaging uh, beast? Because you wouldn't, would you? And and you know that atheists don't do that either. So it's got to be something else at the heart of this, which isn't just uh, isn't just this um, you know transcendental thing. So I think it's just overstated. And you know the, the argument, the way you summed up the argument, maybe it's the way that somebody, you know. Uh, morality requires some. Uh, if God doesn't exist, then uh, yeah, there are well, no objective morals. Well, no, that's just the, the, the premise is false. Morality doesn't require some objective uh, transcendental facts. There are objective elements in morality, by the way. It is an objective fact that pain causes distress and all these kind of things. But you know, you, there is always a a kind of a you know this is ought gap as they say in philosophy there's always a gap between those descriptive facts and uh, the evaluative judgments we make upon them. but that that gap is breached by by sympathy and by compassion so i think it goes back to that same thing that people say a lot of the time if you're if you're if you're a sociopath if you're a psychopath right you're not making any logical errors you you're just you're deficient in right. in basic sympathy and compassion and and that's you you can't argue someone out of it you know 
And Bernard Williams had this great line, actually, where he talked about this type of, type of moral philosopher who believed that, you know, if you had the right arguments, you'd be able to kind of, you know, talk the, uh, talk the Gestapo guard out of it with, with, with reason. Um, yeah. Well. So, so do you, would you want to say that um, there's sort of some useful ethical teaching in there for the variety of kind of meta-ethical views that people might want to take, you know, whether it's this kind of like, platonism of some kind or whether it's like um you know like a an error theorist they, they still might or they still might want to be committed to saying you know i agree with jesus on this point that's a i'm going to live my life that way um yeah i mean i i suppose i i don't think the the meta ethics is perhaps as important as people think it is i think a lot of the most uh, powerful moral arguments have nothing to do with meta ethics they're actually a lot to do with this is something I think in general about philosophy, actually, but I think in moral philosophy too, I think that a lot of it comes from simply attending in the right manner to, to whatever it is you're thinking about. So take one of the most famous arguments in modern moral philosophy, which is the Peter Singer argument about uh, you know, poverty and affluence and everything. It starts with a thought experiment. You're walking past a pond. There's a child in the pond. It's drowning. Um, you could wade in and put it out. Uh, you'll be late for work and you'll spoil your suit do you do it <laughs> and everybody says well of course you do right yeah that's interesting this is the beginning of an argument okay but, but what's it based on it's not based on any kind of logical premise or, or at all it's based on as a decent yeah. human being what's the only thing you could possibly do it, it's, it's appealing to our intuitions in that way mm. and in a way that's all it could do that's all it's all it could do the idea that you could kind of prove that um people have made attempts to try and do this i mean can't try it but i don't think they just they just they just they just don't work so, I, you know, and, and, I, and I think, again, you know, if you take the uh, going back to the woman caught in adultery, it's a powerful story and it speaks to you irrespective of what your broader um, moral commitments might be. Actually, Peter Singer, going to get Peter Singer again. Uh, Peter Singer is also very famous for his introduction of the idea of speciesism. Now, Peter Singer is a utilitarian, but his point about speciesism is, is not a utilitarian point at all. It's simply saying that. The idea of speciesism is that it would be wrong to treat any kind of creature differently purely on the basis of what species it belongs to. Now, some people, if you think that sounds ridiculous, you haven't understood it, right? Because he's not saying that it is irrelevant what species something is, and that you should treat an ant in the same way as you treat a human being. He's saying that you can only treat species differently if there are morally significant differences between them. So... One of the more significant right. differences would be that a lot of species have, you know, basically very little or no cognition. So, you know, you're hardly sort of thwarting their dreams and plans if you sort of stamp on them, whatever it might be. So, but the basic point about speciesism is a point that you can make into a very powerful point, and it speaks to everyone no matter whether they're utilitarians or not. And I think a lot of the most, a lot of the best sort of moral arguments are kind of like that anyway. So it may sound a little bit kind of blasé for someone who's supposed to be a philosopher to say, but I think you know, metaethics is interesting, but I'm not sure it's as important as we think it is for actually mm. determining what we should actually be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Right. Well, I think if we wrap it up around there, because we're just coming up to the hour then, um, but I really appreciate your time and I've really enjoyed uh, reading this book. Would you want to say what the best place is for pe people to um, pick up the book if yeah. they are interested and anywhere anything else you want to plug you know where people can contact you or read your yeah okay. well listen the best way to buy the book is through my website um i will i will admit that i get a commission if you do that but actually that's not the main point so i'm an affiliate of bookshop.uk which is a fairly new initiative which is meant to be like the ethical alternative to you know who um you know those yeah. people who people say is evil but still order from because it's convenient now stop that straight away um this new website um basically supports independent bookshops they they're not, they, they don't make money themselves obviously they make money to keep the operation going but their their mission is to give money to independent bookshops and to uh, affiliate sites like myself so you buy the book from my website you do get a discount anyway that's a small discount um, but 10% goes to a local independent bookshop and 10% goes to me, which is very nice, isn't it? And, and, and everyone pays their taxes, which is very, very important. So I would say that. So it's julianbegini.com. And if you go there, that's basically the place to find out about pretty much 
everything that I do. Um, I'm on Twitter as well, uh, Julian Bagini, and I am starting a Patreon site. And I suppose I should just mention that. So if you're not familiar with that, just well, just have a little Google Patreon slash J Bagini, whatever it might be. Um, and that means that if you're particularly interested in what I do, for in return for supporting me a bit every month you get quite a lot of exclusive stuff actually um talk recordings podcasts articles that have never been published or have been published but have since disappeared from the web uh, pre-publications of things offers monthly philosophy salons online it's basically a, a huge bargain so um <laughs> well or not i'll leave you for you to decide that so yeah juniorbegin.com have a look there Great. And I'll put the links in the description uh, for those who are interested. Um, I hope everyone who's watching has enjoyed the video. And if you have, be sure to like it to just help promote it with the algorithm and everything. And let me know what you thought in the comments. Um, yeah. And thanks for coming on, Julian. We'll end it there. Well, thanks, Nathan. Really enjoyed it. Thanks.